Welcome to This is the Gospel, an LDS Living podcast where we feature real stories from real people who are practicing and living their faith every day. I'm your host, Corinne Lay. In this episode, we're telling the stories that celebrate one of our most beloved cultural traditions. Of course, I'm talking about that Sunday once a year when the primary children take over our sacrament meetings and share their growing testimonies, sing those beautiful primary songs, and let's be honest, pick their noses in public. The primary program is always a highlight of my year. It's special for the kids, it's rewarding for the parents, teachers, and leaders, and whether we have kids or not, it reminds us that the gospel is actually quite simple at its core. We put out the call on Instagram to gather your tales of primary programs near and far, and we got back an amazing mix of stories. Let's start with a roundup of some of your unforgettable funny moments. My husband and I sit right up close in a sacrament meeting so that we can help my son who might need help with behavior during the program. So we had a front and center seat one year for watching the kids who had learned sign language to one of the songs. And one boy in particular was standing right in front of my daughter. And we noticed that he had gotten so creative and he had figured out a way to smack his neighbor with every single sign. So as his arms would go out in a beautiful, graceful sign with the rest of the crowd, he would smack his friend. And then in the next sign, He would find a way to elbow him. And in the next sign, he would find a way to thump him. And we were pretty impressed with his creativity. Even more so because, turns out, he was the primary chorister's son. When my oldest daughter was in sunbeams, she was snacking on some grapes during sacrament meeting. And as they called the kids to come sit on the stand for the primary program, she popped two huge grapes in her mouth, one in each cheek. And... As the kids all got up there, they all started singing this song. And there was my daughter right in the front row with a panicked look on her face and her mouth full of grapes. She wasn't sure what to do. She couldn't sing because her mouth was full. But she started chomping on these huge grapes during the song and missed the whole thing. When I was in high school, I remember attending one primary program that I will never forget. I was visiting a different ward with my friend, so I didn't know any of the children, but I was still really excited knowing that primary program is always the best Sunday of the year. One of the little children, a boy, probably about sunbeam age, stood up at the pulpit ready to say his part. As we were all anxiously waiting, his eyes became very wide. He had us all on the edge of our seats thinking, oh dear, where is this going to go? He stood there for a full minute and then suddenly sneezed right into the microphone. The congregation let out an obvious laugh, but we all settled down thinking he's going to continue on his part. But nope, he just went to sit down. Apparently, that was all the message he needed to deliver that day. We have a six-year-old son with special needs. Um, He has delayed speech, so he doesn't talk very much or very clearly. So during our recent primary program, when his classmates were all given uh, short lines to deliver, his teacher said that maybe it would be best if he just held a picture of Jesus. So on the day of the program, when his class went up to the microphone to deliver their lines, he stood there and held his sign. And as his classmates went up to the microphone, they all froze and the Uh, wouldn't deliver their lines. Well, Alan got bored and turned his picture around and looked at the front of it and said, Jesus! And that was the only line that got delivered by his class, that program. That was Annika, Jamie, Letitia, and Paul with some totally relatable stories from the front lines of the primary program. Many of the stories we received mentioned kids with special needs, and I was blown away by the efforts and love demonstrated by primary leaders who sought inspiration to make sure every child had what they needed. First, we'll hear from Miriam and then from Ryan, a dad whose experience with the primary program could only be described as bursting with the spirit. In our primary, we have a seven-year-old autistic boy named Blake who isn't very verbal. However, we do know that he loves music. We asked his family, all eight of them, to sing Families Can Be Together Forever. 
Blake was right up front and sang his heart out for the first verse, and then his family quietly joined in the chorus and second verse. It was such a special moment hearing Blake sing unprompted and unassisted. I feel like every one of us in the room got a little glimpse of Blake's spirit, who he really is inside. We could feel his testimony as he sang his song with complete confidence. There were not many dry eyes. It's a moment I know I will never forget. So the thing you have to understand is we have a history of epic primary practice and performances and stuff. Um, My oldest has special needs. He has fragile X syndrome. And so he has a lot of social anxiety. And it usually evolves either my wife or I having a mental breakdown at the end of it because, you know, you have you have the whole parade of normal children and then you get to compare yours against it. And so we we have a very understanding ward that tries to help with these situations. And um, for just for example, in the past, he he's actually thrown his shoes from the stand and like one time it hit into the the sacrament table and made, you know, huge noises and cups and and everything. And so so this this past Sunday was our primary program and we were trying to decide whether to even go to church. I was trying to convince my wife that maybe we should just skip town cuz they're going to have a meltdown on stage and then we're going to cause a scene and then my wife is going to, you know, feel all that guilt and pressure and so I just I didn't want to have to deal with all of that. And so but you know, her being the wise mother she is, wanted to give them the opportunity. And so we went this Sunday, and I'm actually a primary teacher, and so I went to the primary practice, and they came up with an excellent plan for my eight-year-old to, they would bring him a mic plugged in and bring it to his seat, and then they could, he could duck down, and so no one could see him, and he would say his part, and everything went great. The problem is, is our five-year-old suffers from social anxiety naturally, and then his example growing up is Calvin. He was super stressed out, and so we bribed him to no end with all these toys and presents if they would just say their part and sing, and the practice went amazing. So I was like, okay, we figured out the special recipe. So we show up on a Sunday, and the kids go up onto the stage, and Calvin actually, my 8-year-old, starts waving at us all excitedly, which is huge for him. And so I was like, okay, this is going to be good. We're into the second song, singing, and my five-year-old's up there just beaming, singing, and all of a sudden he starts scowling at us. And and so Kim and I are, you know, using our animated faces and trying to, like, give him thumbs up and everything. And then by the end of the song, he's bawling. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's like, I don't know if you've seen Pitch Perfect, but it was projectile vomit all over the stage. And, like, a couple of the adults had come down to try to, like, comfort him before this occurred. And so Kim runs up there and grabs him and, like, holds him like a baby, running out. He's covered from head to foot in vomit. There's there's another couple other parents trying to clean up the mess. And the show must go on. So, they're like, the show doesn't even take a, a break. Like, it just keeps plugging through. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And so, and then the, my favorite part was one of the adults that had come down to try to comfort him had caught some of it. And so he's running behind Kim with his hands cupped with like a nauseous face on his face. And so anyway, so that was our experience. And so I'm texting Kim trying to figure out what I, if she wants me back there or if she wants, you know, help. She's like, no. She's like, I think I got it covered. She's like, I'm just going to stand by the door, see if Calvin says his part, and then I'm going to take Hudson home. And so the good news is Calvin did say his part. He ducked down and he said his part. His part was the Holy Ghost makes me feel warm and soft. And so you could, they had the microphone down there and he was crouched down there. And he's obsessed with um, Mashems. There's these little squeezable characters of all the different movies, and they're an absolute waste of money. And so um, we had bribed him with them, and so when he went to say his part, all I kept hearing with the microphone over the whole speaker system was, warm and soft, warm and soft. I get my mashup now, right? Everyone's just, like, confused because no one knows where this microphone, no one even knows about, besides those of us in the program, no one knows that there's going to be a microphone used besides the pulpit. And so... To be honest, 
for a massive projectile vomit experience, it went as good as it possibly could have. Uh, if I could talk to the whole ward, all I would say was just, you know, just to express thankfulness. They they always go above and beyond trying to help Calvin and trying to help him give opportunities, but also support him in those opportunities. It, you know, it, you just see the the value in a ward family in situations like that. So for those parents that do have special need children and are in a, some similar situation as me, which I know the situations vary greatly, I would just encourage you not to be negative like I am or can get caught up in being because because my wife is right. Like if if we never give them those opportunities, they're never – you know, maybe we would have avoided that whole situation, but we would have never had the success that Calvin had. Like all day yesterday, he kept asking me, Dad, aren't you so proud of me? Aren't you so proud of me? I said my part. I said my part. And so like he feels this sense of accomplishment that would never have occurred if I had led into my fear. And so thinking outside of the box on situations like that of how your kid can be successful, like I didn't think of the the microphone you know, getting taken to him to his seat. It was an amazing teacher who has an immense love for him. And so you just don't run from the situations. Try to figure out how you can modify the situation to be successful and and be a wonderful experience for your kid. As anyone who's ever served in a primary presidency knows, there are months of work and stress and love and bribing that go into making this primary presentation thing happen. Here's a story from Laura, who found an unexpected blessing and a message of God's love for her through her own efforts to create an amazing primary program for her ward. I was put in charge of the primary program this year, and so I wanted the kids to come up with each of their own parts. So I asked one little girl, what makes a good mom and dad? And she said, getting them potty trained and teaching them how to roller skate. Another little boy, when I asked him, if Heavenly Father came to visit you one day, just for one day, what would you want to do with him? And he said, I would show him my Spider-Man shoes, and then we would play superheroes. There were lots of little treasures like that throughout the interviewing of the primary kids, and it was so fun to interview them. But the best part was probably interviewing my own children. A little backstory. My husband, um, the last three years, has not been an active member of the church. He has um, lost his faith, and so I've been raising my four daughters. Um, When it comes to the church stuff, kind of doing that all on my own. So if I want to do scripture study, no one else is going to jumpstart that. It's me. To do family home meeting, I have to be the one to initiate that. And it's been kind of daunting for me. But to hear my youngest, when I asked her, what's your favorite part of Heavenly Father's plan? To have her say, because it shows me that Heavenly Father loves me all day. That was very rewarding. My next daughter, I asked her, what is it that you want to do when you become a mom to teach your kids about Jesus? And she said, I would want to pray with them every day and read the scriptures. And then my next daughter was able to bear her testimony about conference and listening to conference and how it brings the Holy Ghost into our home and brings a peace into our house. To hear my oldest daughter, who's almost turning 12, bear her testimony of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. To hear her say that it, the Book of Mormon testifies of Jesus Christ was just very fulfilling for me and that was a very big payday. I was grateful for the opportunity to write the primary program because it gave me the opportunity to see that I am doing a good job and that with the Savior that I can raise these girls with strong testimonies. Our final story today comes from Thomas. Thomas's story is of a primary program that forever changed the course of one family's history. My name is Tom Araski. I was born and raised on the north side of Chicago 
uh, in a Roman Catholic family where I was taught to pray, to keep the Sabbath day holy, and to have faith in Jesus Christ. I was blessed because of that start I had. January of 1975, the doorbell rang. My son, Tommy, and my daughter, Jenny, two and one, were sitting on my lap watching cartoons when an elder Pell and an elder call from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints walked up and handed us a letter from La Banda, Argentina, from my sister-in-law, Alice, who introduced us to the church and bore her testimony in the letter of the truthfulness of the restored gospel. We invited the missionaries for dinner and many discussions for many months. We also met a couple, Marianne and Carl Schof. Carl started to invite me to the North Shore First Ward, the Wilmette Stake, on Saturdays to play basketball, and Marianne invited my wife, Rita, to go to Relief Society functions. They invited us to go to church many times, but my activity on Sundays for years and years was to play football with kids that I had grown up with. October of the same year, on a beautiful Sunday afternoon, I made the choice, instead of playing football with my friends, to go to the Wilmette Stake Center and see what the sacrament meeting was about. I had taken my daughter, Jennifer. She was dressed in a nice white dress, white sandals, and a white ribbon. We went and sat on the back row, and I watched as people started to file in. I saw that my daughter fit in with the the rest, decked out in their Sunday best, but I started to feel very uncomfortable in a white T-shirt, blue jeans, and white gym shoes. As I watched them come in, I decided I needed to get out and get out quick, As I turned to pick up my daughter to make the escape, she was gone. She had crawled underneath the back bench, had ended up way at the other end of that bench, couldn't see her. I saw the the, um, people looking around to see what was underneath their feet, and I thought, great. I was mortified. Just then... A man stood up, introduced himself as Bishop Joseph Hicken, and the sacrament was passed. He stood back up and invited all the primary children and announced the program that it was going to be primary Sunday. Not knowing anything about it, I sat and watched as children little older than mine go up to the front and for the next 45 minutes, bear their testimony of the restored gospel and their faith in Jesus Christ. I was astounded. I thought, who are these children? Are they a special group from Salt Lake City that shipped all over the country? I found Marianne and Carl and was astounded to find out that these were just children from that ward I made a decision that day. I wanted my children to have the same opportunities as these children to bear their testimony. I decided that I would be coming back. Not long after that, I was baptized in February of 1976 and moved to the Buffalo Grove Second Ward of the Buffalo Grove Stake. There for the next 24 years, The people of that ward supported our family to the point where our children made choices to go on a mission, to be married in the temple. Right now, I am so grateful for those people back in the North Shore First Ward that made the sacrifice to put the first primary Sunday that I ever attended together. 
I no longer, in fact, I never did go back to play football with my friends, but I still like to sit on the back row. But in 10 days, I will be sitting on the stand with other people, for I have the best calling that I could have in the church. I will be sitting next to my primary class. My calling is a primary teacher. And I say it's the best calling that I could have. Not that it's better than any other calling, but it's the calling that my Father in Heaven and Jesus Christ have called me to, to teach. Thanks to Thomas and Ryan and all of our storytellers today who submitted stories through Instagram. I think we can all agree that this is what it's like to live the gospel of Jesus Christ at its best. A mix of sweet, spiritual, hilarious, and sometimes messy moments that we celebrate together as a church family. That's it for this episode of This is the Gospel. Join us for more stories next time. And until then, if you'd like to find other episodes from our This is the Gospel podcast and video series, you can find us at ldsliving.com backslash this is the gospel. Have a great week.